Um, we are uh, picking up on uh, slide 96, <clears throat> and we are in Revelation chapter 10. <clears throat> right, we finished chapter 9. I've got a note here. It says evening, 3 7. Today's the 7th, right? Okay. And it's hard, so. Right. It says the second interlude right here before the little open scroll. All right. <coughs> okay. So, are we recording already? Yes. Oh, my. <laughs> Sorry. I got to get mine going, too. Right. There it goes. Stop. Back up. Right there. Go record. All right. So we're all on. <coughs> all right. We have finished almost the uh, the trumpets. We're at the. We just finished the sixth trumpet. We are at chapter ten, where we have a little interlude. You'll remember when we looked at the seals on the scroll that after the sixth seal we had an interlude in chapter 7 which was a look at the final judgment and the final celebration okay. so that and the end and chapter 6 ended with who can stand and stand up to the wrath of the lamb and chapter 7 was the answer all of those are written in the book of life 12,000 from all of the 12 tribes of Israel um, and a multitude from every nation, language, tongue, and peoples, right? <clears throat> and then, chapter 8, we had the uh, seventh seal that was open, which means now the scroll is now open. All the seals are broken. Now it can be open to, to be read. So everything that we've had so far, not only in, the, in breaking the seals on the scroll, but even the trumpets, Okay, um, the scroll that we're going to have handed to John is going to be that scroll from chapter 5 and chapter 6, okay, that Jesus was worthy to okay, break the seals. Now it's open, and it says the open scroll is handed to, to John to be able to read, all right, so... <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> right, so so far the seal visions have shown us the essential aspects of the end time. The Antichrist, war, famine, death, persecution, and cosmic upheavals, right? And that's going to continue as we get more and more details about all that stuff. The trumpet visions have disclosed cosmic catastrophes and demonic plagues, right? All those weird animals. The locusts that weren't locusts at all, the horses that weren't horses at all, right, okay. <coughs> Both have been presented from the perspective of heaven, but now John is back on earth. So that's one thing you need to pay attention to um, in apocalyptic literature. Where are we now? Okay. Are we in heaven? Are we on earth? Are we somewhere in between? Or who knows, right? <coughs> In New Visions, John will present the fate of the church on earth before the final end, and therefore, he is commissioned to prophesy again. <coughs> Excuse me. The question of idolatry, evil, and antagonism against the Messiah and his people will unfold thematically. <coughs> All right. So, so far, the the seals and the first uh, of the trumpets have told us what's going to happen to. Um, to the whole earth, but mostly um, against those who dwell on the earth, which is one of those technical phrases for those who work against God's plan. All right? Now we're going to begin to see what's happening with the Christians, all right, with God's people. All right? The little open scroll. Next slide. Okay? By taking the little open scroll and eating it, John is authorized to continue to prophesy. When the fifth seal was opened, the martyrs were told to wait a little longer. We all remember that, right? Okay. They cry, how long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood? And they say, we got to wait a little longer. 
Okay, now in the interlude, we hear that there will be no more delay. So in that first response to the martyrs was, we got to wait a little longer. Things aren't finished yet. Okay, we need more martyrs. Oh, <laughs> that just, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but now we hear there will be no more delay. The people of God have been sealed, chapter 7, protected from the wrath of God and from the demonic onslaughts of the end time, chapter 9. However, the community which has already experienced tribulation because of its witness, chapter 1, chapter 2, will be subjected to the great tribulation, exemplified in the fate of the two witnesses of chapter 11, and narrated in the visions of chapter 12 to 14. Right? So we kind of get the story, and then we get more details um, <clears throat> about it in the next few chapters. All right? So let's read chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. What does that tell you? Wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow. Is this a good angel or a bad angel? Good, good, angel. Angel. good angel. Okay. And his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. So we have no idea what he looks like. <laughs> okay. That's another part of... Uh, apocalyptic literature and, and prophecy of this sort, a lot of the characters, um, you know who they are? I mean, it, it gives you enough hints or, or sometimes just comes right, right out and tells you who it is, but you really don't get a clear picture of them, okay? Um, right, so, um, he had a little scroll open in his hand, okay? It's open, so, so we can read it, okay? And he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. Have you ever been to an African safari or been at a zoo when the lion decides to roar? Mm -hmm. They say you can hear him for two miles. Mm -hmm. They have, they uh, saw this on television. Not that you care, but it's interesting. I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> okay? The the lion's throat and, and voice box are designed so that he can open his throat really big. <clears throat> and and the roar just resonates from inside from deep. And then <clears throat> and, and when it comes out, it just it just goes and goes. Mm. <clears throat> and it's really and it's really scary. I mean, it's 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 a deep roar. Okay. Um, anyway, so, uh, do, do any of y'all remember when I was little at the foundation center and they had a zoo, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. used to have a line there yeah. and you could hear him every now and then if you were in that area. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. <laughs> do you remember that? So his voice is, it, it's going to travel a long way. It's, it's going to be deep and, uh, that's going to get your attention. Okay. Right. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write what he was hearing, right? Mm -hmm. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. <clears throat> announced, what other word does your Bible use? Just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Any other words? Okay. Any of them say proclaim? No? Okay, anyway. The word there is to speak good news. In the Greek, uh, evangelion, from which we get our word the gospel, the good news. Okay. So the mystery of God that will be fulfilled is the good news that he spoke to his prophets, who also then spoke it to the to the people of Israel and sometimes to the nations. All right. Okay. 
Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open. Again, we're told again, it's, it's now open. In the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. All right, so, <clears throat> so what's in the scroll? Okay, so when he eats it, it it's, have you ever devoured a book? I mean, you, you know the language, right? I mean, oh man, I just, I just, I couldn't put it down. I devoured it all in one day, huh? right? Because, I mean, you, you didn't eat it. What did you do? Read it. Read it, and you wouldn't put it down, and you paid attention to every detail. You didn't want to miss any piece of it. Was that good, right? So with John, when we, when we eat something that's written, when we eat a message, we. We take it in, we, we digest it, right? We, we think about it, we, we go deep with it, we figure out everything we can so that we fully understand all of it, all right? So he eats it, and the message is sweet for him because the message is Jesus gets the last word. He wins the war. But in the meantime, between now and the end, That's there's the a lot of bitterness that has to happen, right? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And it's bitter for those who don't know God, who, who don't want to know God. All right, all right so let's go back uh, and pick up some details, all right? Um, <clears throat> so the interlude refers to the same time span and situation um, as does chapters 12 to 14, all right? So this, we're going to get more details about this in chapters 12 to 14. The 42 months, sometimes it says 1260 days. Um, sometimes it says three and a half years. Okay. Um, the time for the beast to exercise its blasphemous power lasts 42 months. Okay. 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 We have another mighty angel described similar to Christ in chapters 1 and 4. Sun like the uh, face like the sun. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, the legs pillars of fire. Right. Okay, so that can simply tell you that this mighty angel who comes down from heaven was sent by Jesus. Okay, so hang on to that idea. I'm going to go back to chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelations about Jesus Christ. The one revelation about Jesus Christ which God gave him, which God gave to Jesus, to show to his servants okay, the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So God gave it to Jesus to give to the angel to give to John. All right. So, so this angel is sent by Jesus. Okay. He's wrapped in a cloud, got a rainbow over his head, face like the sun, legs like pillars of fire, reminds us of Jesus. He had a little scroll open in his hand, right? Um, the gigantic size of the mighty angel has one foot on the sea, one foot on the land. Okay, is equal to his roaring voice. He represents God and the Lamb who have authority over land and sea because they created it, right? And it tells us that later. Who created heaven and earth and what's in it and what's in it and what's in it, right? The angel tells John not to write what the seven thunders have said. Therefore, we do not know. The oath of the angel, the oath the angel makes, has its background in Daniel chapter 12, verses 4 to 9. Daniel's in here somewhere. Chapter 12, verses 4 to 9 says, but you, Daniel, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. 
Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. Someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time, or three and a half times. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. How far am I going? Verse yeah. 9. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. You don't get an answer. Okay. So now in, G in Revelation, we have the story of the end, right? Okay. Anyway, there were some similar things in there to what we, to what we just read, right? So, um, we often, and are supposed to, remember things that happen, stories that we've heard, pictures that we've seen. Um, when somebody tells a story, there are those hints because the person knows that the audience is familiar with with those stories, those pictures, those events, right? Okay. So you don't need to recount the whole event. You can you can make an allusion to it by simply using a phrase from the story or the movie or the event. Okay. So when we say, um, you know, this is almost as bad as 9/11. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> We all know 9-11, we get all mm -hmm. these pictures and memories and feelings, right? Okay, mm -hmm. So that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. right? So the same thing here. They're going to remember, oh, I've heard this before, Daniel. And they'll, they'll remember the whole Daniel thing. Okay? So we don't need details, we just need the illusion okay, to say there's a connection of some sort there. Okay, The message is similar um, or coming to completion or something like that all right so um <clears throat> so the background is in daniel 12. there daniel seals the book until the time of the end but here john is told there would be no more delay so when the trumpet call of the seventh angel sounds then the mystery of god will be fulfilled what does the word fulfilled mean come to the Okay, all at once. One, two, three. Completely. All at one, one at a time. <laughs> so I mean, I can't hear when six people talk at the same time. All right. Only have two hearing aids. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So <laughs> it will happen as God wants it to happen. Right. It it will be completed. It will be finished. All right. The mystery. Notice the capital letter. The mystery of God is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The one revelation. Okay. Paul talks about the mystery of the gospel. Okay. So let's now just talk about the word mystery. What is a mystery? Something How many of you read mystery novels? Okay. If you get to the end, there's no more mystery, right? <laughs> the mystery is in the middle when you're still trying to figure out who done it. Okay. But if you finish the book, there's no mystery. Okay. So the if if the Paul says the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of God has been revealed to us. It's all about Jesus. Okay. So it's only a mystery to those who don't yet understand, who haven't heard, right? Okay. And the part of this that's still a mystery for us is that we don't know when or exactly how it's all going to happen. Okay. What's the mystery of baptism? The word sacrament comes from a, a Latin word, sacramentum, which is a translation of a Greek word, mysterion, from which we get our word mystery. Hmm. <coughs> okay. That happens with a lot of our church words. They're either Greek or Latin. Okay. Right. <clears throat> then we have to translate them somehow. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But so what's the mystery in baptism or the Lord's Supper? How is baptism a mystery? 
Well, how can God adopt us when we get splashed with water and a couple of words are said? How, how, how is that baptism? I mean, how, you know, how is that adoption? Well, I was thoroughly dunked. <laughs> and um, the mystery is that you wonder how, how is this going to take me? I mean, how, how, where do I go from here? Okay. So. <clears throat> What's my life going to be like now that I belong to God? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. What's the mystery in the Lord's Supper? How's it him and bread and wine and him all at the same time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It tastes like bread. It tastes like, like wine. wine. It goes down like bread. It goes down like wine. Mm -hmm. It's not it flesh and blood. It's blood. bread and wine. Mm -hmm. But it is Jesus Christ. It is his body and blood. We don't know how. And Lutherans will not try to explain how or exactly when the change happens. When does this particular bread and this particular wine become for us the body and blood of Christ? It's a mystery. Okay. Is it when the pastor blesses it? Hmm? Could it be when the pastor blesses? I think it's when it you could believe. be when you believe that it is. Yeah. It, yes. it, it, so so even because because whoever's saying all those words, reading the words out of the hymnal, and mm -hmm. then doing the uh, doing the stuff with the mm -hmm. bread and the wine, the cup and the, uh, everything, okay, they don't have to believe a word of it. But you do. Hmm? You have to and accept that it is. Well, well the, the, but the person who's doing all it doesn't have to believe a thing, and it's still the body and blood of Christ. Oh. Well, I say the person taking it is the one who should believe that it is. Sure, but even if you take it and you don't believe it, it's still the body and blood of Christ. Your believing it doesn't make it so. Why is it the body and blood of Christ? Jesus said it Because Jesus said so. Amen. <laughs> when you come together and like do this, okay, in the community of faith, mm -hmm. there I am in the bread and wine. This is my body. This is my blood. Whether you like it or not, believe it or not, want it or not, I said I would be here for you this way for the forgiveness of your sins. And so whether we believe it or not, it is so. But how does... Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, how is he present in bread and wine? That's a mystery. Mm -hmm. We we believe it because he said so. Mm -hmm. He will not lie to us. So we don't have to know how it happens. We just have to believe that he comes to us that way because he said he would. Okay? <clears throat> All right. And if Pastor Todd tells you anything different, <laughs> time to see you. <laughs> he'll laugh at that thing. okay <laughs> so this mystery this thing we don't fully understand or won't understand till we get to the end of the book okay. till it happens right the mystery is the one revelation of jesus christ from Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ, for us. Okay, He comes both in judgment and salvation. Both happen at the same time. When he comes to, to collect all of his children, his brothers and sisters, <clears throat> those who are not will realize they have been judged and miss out. Okay, So salvation and judgment happen the same day. It's like having a mark on you. He picks the ones that don't have mark on them and right. the other ones go with him. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And he knows which is which, so. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. And as I've said before, there are two bits of good news. One is there is a God. Second one is I'm not him. <laughs> 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 so John takes the scroll. This is the scroll with the seven seals, as we've mentioned. Now it's ready to be read. It's open. Okay. And, and he tells us that at least twice. Okay. He took the open scroll. The seals and the trumpets were warning signs of the judgment and a call to repentance before the end. There are always wars. There are always famines. You know, there are always things that happen in the sky that get people worried. You know, was it Chicken Little? The sky is falling. The sky is... All right, people get upset. All that. Okay? All right. Happens all the time. Right? And in the, in the 
the one chapter apocalypses of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, they all say, all this will happen, but the end is not yet. The gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth and a couple of other things, all right? God's people will suffer as they bear witness to the truth in hopes of bringing more people to repentance and faith. They proclaim, okay? They announce, okay? Which is the, the technical word for they spread the gospel. They speak good news. All right. <clears throat> other thoughts and questions about chapter 10? So in chapter 10, John's kind of like Daniel in that one part where he hears the seven thunders, but he can't write it down. Right. Okay. Now, Daniel wrote it, and it right. was sealed up, but right. John's not even allowed to write it down. down. He got to hear it. Okay. All right. Okay. But he's got the revelation in the scroll, and now that it's open, he's, you know, his eating it is his reading it completely to the point where he fully understands it. Okay. All right. So, and and the part that's sweet is that. Well, what is the part that's sweet? Jesus, Jesus is coming, and we'll we'll be with him because we believe. Mm -hmm. Right. The bitter part is all the suffering we got to do between suffering people. and the people who won't make it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Right. I mean that should that should grieve us as well that there are people die every day without knowing Jesus. Okay. <coughs> All right, let's read chapter 11 before we look at the, at least down to, uh, through verse 14, okay, down to the seventh trumpet. The two witnesses. <coughs> then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, or 42 months, or three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. Why would you prophesy dressed in sackcloth? Okay. Who, who are the people that wear sackcloth and ashes? Repentance people, people repenting. People who are repenting, who are um, grieving their sins. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right. So that's a clue that the word that the that these two witnesses are going to speak are repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> right? The old John the Baptist mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what is where is, who is the temple of God? His believers. Okay. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. The church. Okay. So we are his temple. All right. Okay. Let's keep reading. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. These two witnesses. Okay. So they're, they're called two witnesses, two olive trees, two lampstands. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wouldn't it? Huh? Okay, all right. Aren't there days when you just wish you could just wipe people? Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, let us repent in sackcloth and ashes. All right. <laughs> if anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Who did that in the Old Testament? Elijah. Elijah. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. Who did that? Moses. And to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Who did that? <coughs> Moses. Okay. So we're going to get, this is a hint. That we're going to hear some things that are going to, going to remind us of what Moses did to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And why did Moses do all that to Pharaoh and the Egyptians? To release the Israelites. Well, that was, that was the second part. What was the main reason God did that? To show his power? Nope. No. Nope. What was the result that he wanted? To get his people. 
No. Nope. Israelites. No, nope, that was that's what she said. <laughs> to, to get the other people to believe, maybe. Which maybe. other people? The Egyptians. Yeah, the Egyptians. Okay, that you may know that I am the Lord. Okay, that you're not God. I am. Okay. Again, you know, what did what what were a couple of the plagues? Frogs. Frogs, okay. Then what did the, the Egyptian magicians do? They made, more they made more frogs. How stupid is that? <laughs> <laughs> what was he thinking? <laughs> right. Like, like there's already that. too many frogs. Why would you want to make more? Exactly. I mean that's how you know, it's like uh, and, and we it, said this last it. week or week before, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. Exactly. Like right? right? Okay. Yeah. And the darkness one where it was dark, where the Egyptians were, but not where the Israelites were. Right, it, it was, it, it affected the Egyptians. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure it was true about all ten plagues. Right. But almost all of them, it hurt the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. Because mm -hmm. the plagues were against the Egyptians. Now, if the, if any of the Israelites had, you know, set up house where the Egyptians were, they may have been affected by that. Okay. But the Egyptians but, wanted to move to where the Hebrews were after that part. Yeah. Let's go to Goshen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So just remember the, the plagues and the and the Exodus story as we go through this. All the stuff that Moses did. All right. We're in verse seven. And when they have finished their testimony, these two witnesses, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which is the worst thing you can do to a dead person mm -hmm. if you want to dishonor them you don't bury them you just leave them where they are okay mm -hmm. their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called sodom and egypt where their lord was crucified so what does that tell you this great mm -hmm. city now, see, in Revelation, we have the great city and we have the holy city. They are different cities. You got to pay attention to that, right? So the great city is symbolically called what? Sodom, Sodom and Egypt. Egypt. Sodom, what kind of reputation did they have? Terrible. <laughs> it was horrible. All right, okay, all right. It's the fire and brimstone coming down destroying them. All right, okay, they were, they were very sinful. Okay, what about Egypt? The they didn't believe the plagues. Either. Okay, all right. They were, I mean, the yeah. leaders, anyway, Pharaoh, yeah. okay. He are. considered himself God, so they were idolaters, right? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so the great city opposes God. Where their Lord was crucified. Ooh, so the great city, where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So not the holy city. Jerusalem's not the holy city. In this section, the great city is Jerusalem that opposes God because the religious leaders okay, worked against Jesus. And, and in many places, the religious leaders still do that. Okay. All right, verse 9. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies. Notice only some. And refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Well, wasn't Moses a torment to Pharaoh? Oh, Okay, why? I mean, Moses had, he, he could have fixed everything and put everything back the way it belonged. And, and if Pharaoh had just believed Moses, God would have blessed Egypt more than they had ever been blessed before. Mm -hmm. But no, uh, you know, I'm God of Egypt, the Pharaoh says. And I don't care what your God does. I'm not giving in. Not letting okay. these people go. And it, even though it does say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it was hard to start with. Okay. As with most sinners. Okay. And it needs to be broken down in order for us to hear the gospel. That's the Holy Spirit's job, right? Mm -hmm. okay. right. <clears throat> and if those two witnesses can have fire coming out of their mouth and they can shut off the rain. Then... It's pretty powerful stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. 
um, verse 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God. Ooh, what's the message there? God the gives life. life. God mm -hmm. gives life. Right? He's all about life, not death. A breath of life from God entered them. They stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Yes. So all those, some of the people who for three and a half days says, na 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 na. And then these two witnesses are raised up from the dead, and they say back, na 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 na. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. So they ascended to heaven the same way Jesus did, right? In a cloud. You see how these little things, they remind you of something you, you already know? So most of the time you can make a real good connection. Sometimes you got to be careful about the piece you're remembering. All right. They went up to heaven in a cloud. Their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. Mm. How much? Tenth. Only a tenth. But look how many people were killed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. What did the rest do? 90%. What did 90% do? They're they were terrified. terrified. Gave glory to the God of heaven. 90% so changed their mind. Okay. Right. I mean, at least for a while, they, they're they giving glory to God because this is, he just raised two, you know, and, and they aren't two people, they're, they're the church. Okay. okay. All those who, who gave a witness, all right? The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. All right, so let's look at our slides. All right, they're measuring the temple. Slide 100 or 101. Okay, sorry. Okay, measuring the temple. Chapter 11 continues the vision of chapter 10. Okay, remember what we said last week? Well, forget the chapter divisions, just read the story. Mm -hmm. but try to not to pay any attention to that. And chapter 11 is the overture to the last half of the book of Revelation. I added that this afternoon. Okay, chapter 11 continues the vision of chapter 10 and is the overture to the last half of the book of Revelation. What's an overture? In music, you have a, a big old symphony and you have the overture. What's included in the overture? Little bits and pieces of all of, of the all music. the rest of the music, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, a little bit. So you're getting the story, or the, 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 the introduction to the whole story with all the music. Okay, right. And it really only means something once you've seen the whole opera or the whole play, because then when you hear the the overture you're remembering now oh that's the song when this was happening that's the song okay um i, I like to sing okay but i'm not real crazy about musicals all right they're kind of funny because they have a little bit of dialogue and then there's always something in the dialogue that that you know what's coming right yeah. so when we're watching these things occasionally i'll say i feel a song coming on <laughs> okay all right right i mean you know how it works okay yeah. all right okay all right okay all right, all right. No, i'm sorry um the action is now on earth and john is commissioned to measure the temple the altar and those who worship there measuring the temple is done either in in order to rebuild it to measure the foundation so you can rebuild the walls as was in ezekiel chapter 40 and 41 or in order to destroy it as in Amos chapter 7, or in order to protect and preserve it, as in Zechariah. So we kind of have to figure out which one it is, or if it might be two of the three, or whatever. Okay. <clears throat> in Revelation, it is in order to protect and preserve, since the outer court is given over to the nations, but the inner courts are protected from them. Okay. The outer court of the temple was the court of the Gentiles, who could go no further into the temple. That's where we would be. Well, if we lived, not, in, I mean, I mean, if we weren't Jewish, if, if, we were if you weren't Jewish, Jewish, if you if you hadn't converted and been circumcised, you couldn't go any further. But you were allowed that far, and you could hear what was going on. So you could listen, and all the God fearing Gentiles would go there. But in Revelation, instead of being full of interested Gentiles. The nations are trampling the outer court 
Okay. I mean, God is still protecting the inner court where his people are, all right? But, okay. So in Revelation, it is, you know, the outer court of the temple was the court of the Gentiles who could go no further into the temple. Um, <clears throat> let's think about John's use of the whole temple tradition, all right? Uh, first, the wor it's a worldwide Christian community. Okay. As Paul says in Corinthians, okay, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says that about the whole church, and he says it to individual Christians. He uses it both ways. Okay. Jerusalem is the world hostile to God in Revelation. Okay, they are the great city. Okay. And we were just told that because it's where the Lord was crucified. Okay. Right. Um, true worshipers are promised protection from God's wrath and preservation in the end time tribulations for 42 months. Okay. Sooner or later we're going to figure out why the three and a half years. Okay. But not yet. Okay. The holy city is the Christian community, the temple of God. All right. And the New Testament um, references are 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 2 Corinthians 6, and Ephesians 2. John is to measure the sanctuary, the, the main temple, the altar, and the worshipers to determine who belongs to God. I mean, that's what, you know, do you measure up is kind of what we're thinking, all right? So he's to measure the community of faith to find out if they measure up, who belongs to God. And it symbolizes, this measuring symbolizes divine protection. Okay, go find the people Find out that they measure up to, to the the faith of the of the community of God. Okay, all right. The measuring rod that's used would be the Word of God, right, and the testimony of Jesus Christ about Jesus. Okay. We just had the lesson Sunday about um, if you or did I use that last night? I forget. That was <laughs> yesterday. Um, um, Romans ten. Yeah, that was yesterday morning, mm -hmm. right? Romans 10. Okay, um, if you confess with your mouth yes. mm -hmm. and believe mm -hmm. with your heart, right? Okay. Now the heart, I always have to remind people, in Old and New Testament is the seat of the will. It's where you make your decisions and have your commitments. Right? So when you believe with your heart, it's saying you are committed to this confession you've made with your mouth, with your whole being. Okay. So th some of those TV preachers who say you can miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance between your brain and your heart. Okay. Well, I'm short, so it's not quite 18 <laughs> inches. But, right? Anyway, okay. Not so. I mean, we know that that you know it's the, the heart is your whole self being committed. Like I love you from the bottom of my heart, which means what? I love you just with a little piece of my chest. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it means I love you with my whole self, right? From every part to the very deepest part of me, okay? All right. But, <clears throat> um, number six, a prophetic anticipation of the measuring of the new Jerusalem, which is a perfect cube in Revelation 21. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, and 1,500 miles high. Mm. That's big. Sounds like And if you figured out that how many people you think might be in heaven, or if you divided it up into, let's say, um, like 500 square foot apartments for everybody, if everybody got a 500 square foot apartment, mm -hmm. that's a decent size apartment for one person, right? Okay, mm -hmm. right. You wouldn't believe how many you could get in a cube 1,500 miles wide and deep and high. Mm -hmm. Amazing, right? Okay, so... So, I mean, it's like, but it's, it's not intended to be literal. The holy city isn't going to be a cube. The cube is the perfect shape. So it just kind of represents perfection. Okay. All right. The new Jerusalem. Okay. 42 months. Three and a half years. We've already looked at Daniel. The time from the persecution and abomination by Antiochus Epiphanes. The fourth. Okay happened in 167 BC to the rededication of the temple in 164. Isn't that the guy with the pig? Yes. Okay. He uh, 
Um, he set up a uh, statue of Zeus on the uh, altar in the temple, and then he sacrificed a pig on the altar. So, of course, for the Jews, this completely desecrates you know, and makes unholy, unclean, the whole temple, not just those pieces. Okay. So, um, after um, uh, they won the little their little battle against the the uh, Greeks, then um, they rededicated the temple. So that three and a half years, okay, is just used as the time. And that period of time is in Daniel. Daniel was written in 165 B, 160, probably 164. Okay, um, he it wasn't written 400, 400 years before Jesus. It was only written 164 years before Jesus. So his three and a half years in Daniel represents that period of time of that persecution. Okay that he lived through. He really wasn't living during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. He was living during this time. Okay. Anyway. All right. The number 42, the number of months, is a messianic number. Three times 14. If you remember the uh, Gospel of Matthew, he, in his lineage of uh, Jesus, he splits it up into three sections of 14 generations. Okay. All right. 14 is the sum of the letters in David's name, 464. Four. And of course, Hebrew doesn't have any vowels, so they're all consonants, right? And just like Roman numerals are the same as numbers, same thing in, in Hebrew, right? 42 months indicates the period of the Messianic woes, in which the community of faith must endure and make its witness, and the time in which the beast can exercise its bloody authority, right? So, in a sense, what Revelation is, is saying is that, I suppose, right before Jesus comes back, things are going to get really nasty. Mm -hmm. But they've been really nasty for a lot of people on the earth for a long, long time. Right? In Russia, in China, in North Korea. North Korea is the worst place to be a Christian. Right? In today's world. Okay? Places in India, uh, almost any Muslim nation... It's really hard to be a Christian there, okay? Because they don't like us. Because Muslims are about world domination. They're going to take over the world somehow. Um, and anybody who gets in their way, they don't like. Okay? And they have, uh, um, what's his name? Um, their prophet? Muhammad. They have Muhammad's permission to lie about things in order to get their way. <laughs> it's in the Quran. Okay? All right. So, anyhow. Um, so we must endure and things will get nasty uh, and that's the message for Christians in Revelation it's hang on to the end the letters to the churches he who conquers he who you know endures and perseveres all right, will receive the crown of life and so many other good things all right, okay. all right the two witnesses oops how'd that happen mine just got small <laughs> What you do? <laughs> he said the little scroll, so it went little. He said the little scroll, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Touche. It's now the little slide. Yeah. I can still read it, but anyway, okay. <laughs> By eating the little scroll, John received a foretaste of the things to come. Now he will show us why the little scroll tasted sweet and bitter, and why the community, in spite of divine protection, is subject to being trampled down by the nations. The section has two parts. Verses 3 to 6 describes the two witnesses. These are, these have, right? And verse 7 to 13 narrate their fate and its effects. The voice of Christ calls and empowers his witnesses. These two priests, kings, witnesses, olive trees and lampstands are also prophets. They bear witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. They witness for 42 months, the period of the church's persecution, when the holy city is being trampled. The holy city is the people of God. Since we are the temple of God, right? the holy city is the people. Okay? 
That's one thing a lot of the interpreters of Revelation, they, they read it very literally, most of it. I mean, some places are obviously symbolic and they get that. But like here, you know, the holy city they take as Jerusalem. Okay, well, no, John, it's the, it's the his people. They are dressed in sackcloth, meaning they preach repentance in view of the impending doom. The olive trees and lampstands are a reinterpretation of Zechariah chapter 4 and chapter 6, where they are the king and the high priest okay, in those um, parables or visions okay, in Zechariah. All right. So again, a bunch of the stuff, if you don't know your Old Testament, you, you would miss a lot of this stuff. Okay. But then again, we have to remember, <clears throat> I'll remind you, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish Old Testament. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. <laughs> right? We Gentiles have been grafted into the Jewish nation. The true believers, the true children of Abraham. Right? Okay? All right. So we Christians need to know our Old Testament because, it not, because it's the story about Jesus, right? And when he finally gets here, he fulfills all that stuff. All right. <clears throat> we remember that the lampstands are the churches in chapters 1 and 2, right? We were told Jesus uh, is in the midst of the lampstands. He's in the midst of his church. Therefore, these two witnesses represent the Christian community as a whole. If they are the lampstands, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. In Zechariah 4, this is a good verse. I keep forgetting this one, but it's really great. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So how is is how will the people of God conquer or, or get through the tribulation? With the Holy Spirit. Yeah, by the Holy Spirit. Not because they're stronger than the nations or or you know, mightier or more powerful, but but by being filled with the Spirit and speaking the Word of God. Even if it means they kill us. Even if we become martyrs, we get the victory. Right? Okay. The Christian community fulfills the functions of kings and priests in the power of the Holy Spirit. They are under God's protection. <clears throat> Fire from their mouths recalls Elijah's destruction of the idolat idolatrous king Ahaziah. Let's look at that. I don't remember him breathing fire. Second Kings chapter one. Somewhere around page five ninety. <laughs> that won't really help you much, will it? Second Kings chapter one, verses two to seventeen. Get a good story like this. <laughs> All right. Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick, so he sent messengers, telling them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, It is because there is is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah went, and he said all that, right? Um, let's go down to verse 9. Then the king sent to uh, Elijah a captain of 50 men, with his 50, he went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, Come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And I think he did it once or twice more. All right? Okay. All right. Good story. All right. Okay, so fire from their mouths. 
Okay. How many of you remembered that story? Okay. No? Oh, see, uh, you don't read Second Kings, do you? <laughs> okay, all right. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow night's reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to read it tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So, um, <clears throat> um, they have power to shut the sky. Of course, we, we know the drought of Elijah. But for some reason, we remember that one. Um, waters are turned to blood, and they smite the earth with plagues. Moses had power to humble the Egyptians. And this points forward to the plagues of the bowl cycle. All right, so the plagues are coming. The spirit-filled community is successor to Moses' rod and Elijah's mantle. So we will continue the work of Moses and Elijah and the prophets and even Jesus himself as we continue our ministry and witness about him. Just as the plagues of the first six trumpets came as response to the church's prayers and the cosmic upheavals followed the cries of the martyrs, so the prophetic witness will call forth the eschatological law of retribution. What's retribution? Mm -hmm. You get what you deserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the other word? Es yeah, what was it? Eschatological? The eschaton is um, the study of the end times. Eschaton is the end time. Eschatology is the study of the end times. Eschatological is the adjective. So the eschatological law of retribution would be the law of retribution that will be carried out in the end times. Okay. Good question. Thanks for asking. That was okay. We learned a lot of those big words at seminary. It was fun. <laughs> it took me, I, I'll bet I was a pastor 10 years till finally the teleology finally sunk into my head. The telos and the teleology. That's, just, that's for another lesson, okay? Right. We don't care about that tonight, but it's like all of a sudden it's like I'd see the word and it's like, I know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. I'm sorry. Okay. Have to tell this on me, though. After we had our first theology class, we had two questions on the final. You could answer one. You picked one. Mm. I read the first question. There was a word in there I didn't know. So I had to answer the second one. The second one was easy. The second question was, what does it mean that Jesus lives? I knew all those words. <laughs> 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 anyway, but the other the other word was one of those big ology words. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> I've never seen that word. Before. I will never forget. <laughs> um, power to where? Did I, oh, whoops! Didn't I read all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Fate of the two witnesses. When they have finished, ah, oh, there's the word, telio. Okay. Okay. Completion of a mission. It comes from, from the, the whole concept of telos, which is um, tell us what you're all about. May be the way to remember it. Okay. All right. The it, it's it's the end. It's the reason you exist. It's what you were made for. All right. There's a story told, and it's a true story, so everybody says. Um, Francis of Assisi, you know him? He was the guy, the monk who cared about the animals. So he went to a, a market, Saturday flea market one day, one Saturday, okay, and he he saw a guy who had birds in cages, selling birds to people. Right? Okay, he bought all the birds, and then he opened all the cages, mm -hmm. let all the birds out, because the end, the telos of a bird is to fly, not to be in a cage. Hmm. Hmm. They get to complete their mission, be what they were created to be, hmm. by flying. Hmm. Okay, so when the witnesses finished, brought to completion their mission, uh, their testimony, we are introduced to the major opponent of the church, the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit. The demonic locusts, which came from there, were used by God as executors. Ex no, 
Yeah, executors, right? <laughs> Exit. <laughs> yeah, those big words. Who put that in there? <laughs> they were used by God as executors of his wrath on those who dwell on the earth. But this beast will make war on the church and conquer and kill them. This beast corresponds to the beast who comes out of the sea in chapter 13 and is modeled after Daniel chapter 7. It is the anti-image of the Lamb. The fate of the witnesses parallels that of their Lord, right? He was beaten and crucified and raised from the dead. So the theme of the church's eschatological struggle, or struggle at the end of time, right, and its apparent defeat is developed. Dynamic prophets, preachers, and witnesses will experience protection and also death and resurrection like their Lord. Their witness leads to an apparent triumph of evil, just as it did on Calvary's hill. Though God equips his prophets, he does not exclude them from suffering death and execution. And we already talked about the dead bodies. Um, let's go to the next slide. Resurrected body. People from every land gaze at the dead body. Greek has a single body, not two bodies. Right? We're talking about two witnesses. Mm -hmm. But in the Greek, it talks about one body. So they look at the body. Which is a hint for us that these two wit witnesses represent the one church. So they're looking at the body of the church. Okay, um, We miss that kind of stuff in the original languages all the time in both Hebrew and Greek. Um, like we have uh, a word you that can be singular or plural. So when it's translated in our Bibles, we don't know if he's talking to the whole group or just one person sometimes. You can't tell the difference. All right. We have one word for love. Greek has three or four. So which one is it? Like in John, when Jesus restores Peter, he says, um, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? And Peter's response is, you know I phileo you, that I love, <laughs> it's a Greek word, okay. You know that I love you with a brotherly love, with family love. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now in John, it happens that occasionally he will use those two interchangeably. It doesn't seem to matter a lot. But you wouldn't, you can't pick that out because we have one word for that. Okay, all right. So Peter doesn't really say, well, you know I love you unconditionally. He says, no, I love you like a brother. Okay. It's not what I ask you, Peter. <laughs> okay. All right, anyway. I um, don't love you, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So people from every land gaze at the dead body, singular, indicating that the witnesses are considered as one corporate entity. The people rejoice, make merry, and exchange presents in celebration. But after three and a half days, bre the breath of life from God enters them, corresponding to Jesus' resurrection after three days. Right? Their resurrection and ascension in the cloud take place for the world to see. Okay? But only the disciples saw Jesus ascend. So this introduces the notion of the first resurrection unfolded in chapter 20. <coughs> After they're resurrected, there's a great earthquake, a tenth of the city, and only a tenth perish. But 90% of the people were terrified and give glory to God. To give glory to God is the proper response to the good news. God's triumph in the resurrection of the witnesses brings about the salvation of the rest of humanity. The second woe has passed, the third is to come. The second woe connects the plagues of the trumpet vision with the activity of the beast from the bottomless pit, as well as with the bitter taste of the little scroll. Because okay. now we have the, 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 uh, the beast from the bottomless pit is introduced. Okay? Second all events. Let's see if we can skip a couple of these. Directed against the godless world prophetic church. They don't help at all. We'll play against God. The beast action. They seek to destroy the church. The third world connects the trumpet visions. We don't have the third world. Okay, so then let's read um, chapter 11, beginning at verse 15, the seventh trumpet. <clears throat> then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. 
And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All right? Now this is the end. Right? Or the beginning. Because you see, when Jesus was resurrected, this is true. At that moment, he is king. Nothing can stop him. He's going to He's going to win. He has won the war. Okay. The devil is defeated, but not destroyed. Death is defeated, but not destroyed. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. But people are still dying, so that enemy has not been destroyed, but has been defeated because we have the hope of resurrection. You get the difference? Between being defeated and destroyed? Okay, all right, don't forget that. In fact, you remember that, and you just you just show how good you are. You explain that to Pastor Todd, okay? All right, just, I mean, he knows that too. All right, okay, boy, i just let you know. But, okay, anyhow. So the um, the third will connects the trumpet visions and the interlude with Paul. Oh, wait, we were reading the Bible, weren't we? forgot where I was. All right, verse 16. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces. So they're off their thrones, fell on their faces, and they worship God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Hmm? You have begun to reign. Now we know that God has been ruling over his world since the very beginning. Okay. So, so they're not saying... You know, we're, we're thinking back to the very beginning. They're saying, you know, that there has been a, a defeat on the battleground against the devil. Okay. And he has begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints. And those who fear your name, both small and great. And for destroying the destroyers of the earth. See, I mean, that's the end times, right? That's the end. That's the final judgment. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Wow. But then it gets fun. Chapter 12 is fun. Okay. All right. <laughs> How many, what's, how far do you have your, your handouts to? What number? One, 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 nine. one what? One twenty-nine. One twenty-nine? Okay. And then we got the next set, so we can get that. Well, we probably won't, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, on slide 114. Seventh trumpet continued. The time for judging, in verse 18, the time for judging the dead and to reward your servants has come. To reward means to fulfill the promise of salvation to his faithful servants. Salvation received in baptism must be proved in life and conduct, in tribulations, by rejecting idolatry, and in faithful perseverance to the end. Okay, that is a very important point. Okay, so in when I was at seminary, baptism was my big bugaboo. I I, I had to understand every piece of that. Right. <clears throat> so Martin Luther, in the large catechism, makes it very clear that baptism, if it is not received by faith, is ineffective. Does it do you a bit of good? If you don't believe that God has claimed you as his own and that you are his son or daughter and then that you live that way. You don't have to be perfect in doing it, but you have to try. Mm -hmm. Okay, so salvation, which is the gift received in baptism yes. and it's when it's received by faith, will show itself in our lives in that we will live a life and conduct ourselves 
through the tribulations, we will reject idolatry, and we will be faithful to the end, to the God who sent Jesus his son to die for us. Okay? So our good works are the evidence of our faith. We don't earn our salvation, but they are the evidence that when we make the confession, I believe Jesus is God's son. He died for my sins. We show that by the way we live. Okay, That's the evidence. How do you know you got an apple tree in your backyard? When you see the apple, when you see it. Hey, I had a guy in my first parish. He did a lot of really neat things, but one of them was he had nine different apples on one tree because he grafted he'd cut off you know branch and he would graft other apples. so he had well if you do that then you've got all kinds of mixture you know um, anyway so um he could why did i say that we wanted to know how we knew if we had an apple tree oh that's right yeah <laughs> I just, I like, why am i talking about him like, oh, sorry. all right okay would somebody please move that clock to eight o'clock yeah. <laughs> anyway um <laughs> too many meetings oh too many okay um so how do you know how do you know if you're a christian because you live like one most of the time right mm -hmm. you know you, you were talking about baptism is um received receiving received by faith mm -hmm. well why do we baptize as children when the children are too small to receive faith because they're not they're not too small to believe okay who what's the first thing a baby does once it's born cross her eyes okay what's the second thing it does it wants something to eat yeah it wants to eat right who's it go to Mom. Mom. Yeah, okay. And if you hand it off to somebody else who's not mom, okay, he knows. They keep crying and, yeah, okay, until they get fed, all right? Okay. All right. Does the baby ever tell you thank you? No. No. Are they thankful? No. Well, yeah, because yeah, the next they time they want something, they cry for you. <laughs> they want you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They're not able to say so, but, okay, they won't. I just baptized a, a, a young boy uh, two weeks ago. He does not like men. Now he'll get over it because his father was the same way. They tell me, right? Took him a good. He just uh, he he's fine with ladies, but so um, every time they come up for communion, he just tries to get a, away from his mother because he doesn't want me touching him. Okay? So we had lots of fun baptizing him, okay? And I got him good. I got him good and wet, okay? All right, okay. And and he cried and he rooted and he you know he did everything, but. Yesterday, he was fine. He didn't squirm. He didn't say a word. He let me put my hand on his head and bless him for for communion. You know, yeah. um, and he went his way, and it was like, whoa, cool. Right? <laughs> anyway, made but, your day. Okay. Yes. Yes. Actually. Okay. Uh, and, but but his sister is the best. All right. She she took she came up for blessing one week, um, and she was with her grandmother, and then she they turned and. and went to the side and as she turns she looks back and she waves at me <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, you know, it's, it's worth all those four years of study in seminary just for that right <laughs> anyway so apple trees so so children um first of all we have to deal with the fact well i'll, I'll do the short version right um children are sinful because they are completely selfish completely helpless but also completely selfish they're not aware of anybody else but themselves, okay, and their mother, because they're connected to mom, all right, whether they're boys or girls, they're, they, they don't know the difference, but the, by the time the terrible twos hit, they have discovered that they're separate from, the, uh, mm -hmm. they realize they're their own individual person, that's why they just have fun disagreeing with you. You can say yes, but I can say no. I don't have to agree with you. I'm not you. I'm me. And so that's part of what the terrible twos is about, all right? So, you know, it's not wrong for them to do that. They're just having fun being their own person. And if you say yes, I can say no. You say stand up, I can sit down. And, all right, all, all that fun stuff, okay? You say don't do this, and they say, oh, yes, I can, and all that neat stuff, right? So, but, but they have two favorite words. Mine! Mine! 
Not right. Okay. And the other one is no, because you always say do this and you say and they say no. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Or because they're selfish. Or why? Okay. Or why? Yeah. Okay. Why? Right. So <laughs> they're they're selfish from the very beginning, and we know they're helpless, but they only think about themselves, which is the definition of sin. Mm -hmm. I'm the center of the world. Okay. Now let's go to the other end. Really old people. Not us. I mean, <laughs> really old people. Okay. All right. Okay. They can be. They can be completely helpless, like a baby, but they're not completely selfish. Mm -hmm. So you've got your great great grandmother who's 113 years old, and she's thirsty. She says, "Terry, would you get me a drink of water, please?" <laughs> all right. And you say, "In a minute, oh, my hands are all greasy." Whatever you're doing, okay, or full of cookie dough or something, okay. And she'll say, "Okay." right mm -hmm. she won't say no i want it now or i'll shoot you in the kneecap all right she won't do that all right she'll say okay i'll wait my turn all right okay so completely helpless but not completely selfish but babies are so they are sinful right mm -hmm. um but they also know who takes care of them and that's the people that they want they, they don't say thank you they don't know that yet but they know where they know who feeds them. They know who keeps them warm. They know who keeps them clean. They they know who comforts them. They know where to go for everything they need. And if it's and if you don't look like that person, I'm not coming to you. Okay, they can't say so, but they know who loves them. Yeah. If if they're loved, I mean, we know some kids are brought up in homes where mm -hmm. they're not loved. Okay, but but when they're baptized. You know, it's in part of that is directed to the parents too. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's it's your responsibility it's to a bring them up, uh -huh. okay. uh, so okay. that they we charge you since you bring this child for baptism. We mm -hmm. charge you that you bring them to the services of God's house. Mm -hmm. That you the teach Lord's them the prayer, Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Creed, and as they grow in years, you place in their hands the Holy Scriptures. That leading a godly life, they or that oh shoot, I always mess up that last time. <laughs> <clears throat> Shoot the cat! I went to lot. Leading a godly life, that no, that that something or other. They may lead a godly life until the, until the day of Jesus Christ, until Jesus comes back again. So the the parents are supposed to raise the child to mm -hmm. to be able to know that God loves them mm -hmm. and Jesus died for them. And if we do it right, the child mm -hmm. will not know what will will just always know Jesus loved them. I mean, that's my case. I mean, I was blessed to be in churches where the adults always loved the kids. And we always felt safe and cared about and, you know, they liked having us around. So I've just always known it. Okay. Now, I, there would be places where, you know, doubts arose and, you know, we grow in faith and we have those stages where something happens and, and you get deeper in faith and all that. That stuff happens. But I've just always known Jesus loved me. There wasn't a day I was, I gave Jesus my heart or asked Jesus to come into my heart. I've always, I've always known that he had me. Okay. I didn't always live that way. I had my moments and my years, huh? Okay. As we all have, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but if you, if, if you're not taught that all of that mm -hmm. then you won't say thank you to jesus and that's the first thing that faith says when you hear the gospel in whatever way it comes to you when you you know it finally gets you that god loves you jesus died for you you say thank you like you do for any gift okay mm -hmm. right so all right you need a pencil to take notes I'm taking notes. No, I, I know, but you but you need one, and I bought one for you. Okay? Oh, did you? I did. I did. Okay. Right. okay, thank you. See? See how easy that was? <laughs> okay. All right? That cost me $4.16. What did it cost you? Nothing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gifts are free by definition mm -hmm. to the receiver, right? Okay. And our parents teach us that when you receive a gift, you take it into your own possession. You receive it. You, you take it, right? And then they say to you, now what do you say? Thank you. That's how you receive a gift. You claim it as your own. 
and you say thank you to the one who gave it to you. When we do that with baptism, mm -hmm. when we say thank you to God for sending Jesus to die for my sins, mm -hmm. now that's our first words of faith. Well, I understood all that, you know, but I just wondered, you know, as far as, you know, when I don't know if anybody else ever thought about it. I mean, how does a child, you know, receive faith when they're baptized when they're so small? And well, we also teach in, in, uh, that faith is a gift. Mm -hmm. It's the Holy Spirit who brings us to that point where we can't help but say yes. Because mm -hmm. we're overwhelmed with God's love. And it happens in the community of faith and in the family where God's love is shared and given and mm -hmm. abundantly showered on people, right? Okay. So you can't help but say, thank you, Jesus. And you can do that at almost any age. You might not be able to use the words, but... And you may not comprehend fully what it means. <laughs> <laughs> and that's called <laughs> Indian girl. You said you had one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you... And then as you get older in the Holy Trinity Church, you go through the catechism or whatever you want to call it now. And, so far, and then... They do that. They don't call it um, confirmation anymore. Right. They call it uh, affirmation, affirmation of, of exactly. baptism, yeah. mm -hmm. and you start yeah. to understand more at a deeper so, level. But, at a deeper level, but it's, exactly. It's, it's more of. I mean, what do you get at confirmation? I mean, what kinds of things do we actually hand the kids at confirmation? They get a certificate that says you finished the course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they get offering envelopes, right? Mm -hmm. the Bible. Now they're expected to start support to be church. good stewards, support financially, mm -hmm. okay, from their lawn mowing and babysitting and whatever else, okay? Even at 14 and 15. <clears throat> um, they get to vote. Mm -hmm. And they can serve on committee. So now they've taken on adult responsibility in the congregation. Before that, they don't get to vote, they can't serve. Uh, they can't uh, be elected to any kind of position, but once they're confirmed, they can. So it's it's really learning enough to say, okay, I understand. Now, if you say something in a meeting, we have to listen to you. Now, we know you're only 15 years old or 14 or whatever. Huh? So we'll take that into account, but God can speak through anybody he wants to. And if we believe that they understand the faith well enough to say, give me your money, <laughs> hmm? mm -hmm. we should listen. If, and if we believe they have the Holy Spirit, we should listen. Okay. Um, everybody asks that question, how can babies have faith? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's a gift from God, but they, they know who loves them. <laughs> they just can't say so. And we take that, that babies take that gift with <coughs> mine. I mean, you know, we give it to them and it's just like they take everything else. It's mine. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. you gave it to them and they have it. Yeah. Yeah. They don't learn what it is or what it means till. Yeah. And we have to teach them to share. Sharing doesn't come <laughs> naturally. Uh, the guy I work for, my boss, is a independent, fundament, fundamental independent Baptist preacher. Guy. And we were talking about baptism, and he said, "You know, when you sprinkle children, you're condemning them to hell." And he did this whole dissertation about that, and I'm like, "Going, you don't have any right to say that, you know." I mean, but what kind of God does he worship? Exactly, fire, breeze, well, there's water and and the word. Yeah, but he he said, and it, that's really bothered me since he told me that. Yeah. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't understand hmm. how you can think that. Well, that's like some people saying, if a child is born and dies and isn't baptized, do they go to hell? I don't no. think so. No. Of course no. not. No. I wouldn't do that. And, and my, not the yeah. God I worship anyway. Right. And my response to that is, if, if so put yourself in God's position and your child, the one you created, okay, has a short life. What would you do with that person? Would you send them to hell? No, you love that person. You gave them life. He created. It wasn't that baby's fault they didn't get baptized. It was, right. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. And and there are almost at every hospital there, there's um, there's a provision to get your child baptized as quickly as possible. Okay. 
Now, our our technical theology tells us that we we shouldn't baptize dead people, but for the comfort of the parents, we would. Many, almost every pastor would, for the comfort of the parents. Okay, because that child is already with the Lord. Okay. But for the parents' comfort, the pastoral thing to do would be, if they want it done, would be to baptize the child. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. And those are some of the hard pastoral choices we have to make, knowing our theology. But what do you need at the moment? Yeah. That kind of thing. And at one point in this country, there were a lot of babies that died from, you know, I mean. Every child that is aborted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is with Jesus. Mm -hmm. I would. I that would. I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So. Of course, that's not why they're aborting their babies, is it? No. Mm -hmm. They're aborting it for responsibility yeah. of their so, actions. Uh, forget aborting. Well, forget aborting the baby. Abort the parents. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you feel like it. Um, let's find a good place to stop here in another half a minute. Um, so we read the first verse 19. Uh, God's temple in heaven was open so the Holy of Holies can be seen. And the Ark of the Covenant, which was always kept in the Holy of Holies, right? Mm -hmm. The symbol of God's presence and faithfulness was seen. The Ark was hidden by Jeremiah. Or by an angel prior to the temple's destruction in 586. We don't know what happened to it after that. We have no record of the ark. It's not in the Bible story anywhere after that. Hmm. It's not mentioned. Well, we don't know what Indiana happened. Jones says <laughs> yeah. When it was in the Holy of Holies, nobody saw it except for the priest that went in. Is that correct? Am I um, thinking right? I yeah, I, I don't know um, if the... The high priest was the only one allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that curtain, the, the veil, yeah. was opened on that day oh, so the see. people could see him <coughs> make the sacrifice for them or not. I don't remember. Because before you, only the only time they saw it is when it was being moved. Am I remembering right? Yeah. As far mm -hmm. as, I mean, you know, when they were moving. Well, the what, tabernacle yeah, because yeah. yeah. even in the tabernacle, when, when they were moving around, mm -hmm. it was kept in in that you know one oh, spot mm -hmm. only the high priest could so i guess maybe whatever they carried it with you could see poles. that but i mean yeah. but yeah. i mean they could carry see the poles, it around you yeah. maybe could not see everything yeah. well yeah I mean, yeah i mean you could see it you know it yeah just not and, touching you know, it and, from and all that, the things that yeah and, and that raises did. all those questions about um so how holy was it, and what were the real rules? You know, I mean, once it got put in its place, then only the high priest could go in there. But when they moved it, everybody could watch. Yes. But only the priest designated could carry it on poles. Right. Not touching. Not touching it. Okay. And when David brought it back to, sh oh, I forget where. Anyway, he, he, they had a brand new cart, never used for anything, just hot off the presses, all right? He set the ark on the cart, and they were moving it to where he wanted it. And a couple of the priests walking alongside, it, it hit a bump, and was ready to turn over, and they caught it, and they died. As much as David was trying to do a good thing, he forgot the rules about carrying the ark with poles, by the appointed priests. Mm -hmm. So, because God says, this is holy. This is, this is how you handle whole, this holy object. Okay. And sometimes it seems so simple. As long as they're honoring it in their hearts, you know, it's like, oh, it's like, but I don't, <laughs> but who's going to know that but God? So it's like, so you can show outwardly that you are honoring this most holy object. This is the way you will transport it, only with poles by the appointed priest. You know, so. All right. So we'll pick up um, uh, chapter 12 next time. All right. Are we going too slow?
You want to go a little faster? Is this, is this pace no, okay for you? Good. Okay. All right. We're we are doing a lot of repetition, but that's the way some things stick. Yeah. Right. So if that's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll just keep going. Chapter twelve. Chapter twelve. Um, next week is council meeting, right? Right. So we'll meet in. Twenty-first. Twenty-first. Yeah, we'll meet in two weeks. Well, that's what's on these. Do these need to be handed out, or do they just? We can't hand them out. Need to stay here till next week. Um, week after next. No, hand, no, hand them out. Yeah. Hand them out. Yeah, hand them out. Yeah. Because yeah. 12 and 13 goes down to. Take them down. Press them down. Take one down. Take one. Take one. Take one. Take one. Oh, take one. I think it's, no, it's oh, a whole set. set. It's a whole set. It's a whole set. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They're in sets, yeah. Okay. You're going to give them to Jane Pass it on them. Pass it on them. They're going to give them to Jane Beth. 12. Not, not, to, not to him. You just want? Yeah, we just yeah, want. Yeah, one. Yeah. One's fine. One's plenty for us. We go. How far so should we be? No, this letter. I can find a new one. This letter. Is it just three pages? Uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14 for next time. Okay. 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 May or may not get that far, but anyway. Chapter 15. We're getting close to this. I know people. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, we probably won't get to 14, but 12 and 13 for sure. Okay. How many of you are reading the slides as well as the chapter introduction? I mean, before you get here. Yeah, we don't have the ones out. Okay, all right. Okay. I think it would help. Uh, it help you keep up. Because right, if you do that, then I don't have to read all the slides to you. We can. Uh, we would move faster if we make sure you have the slides ahead of time. And it might help you read and understand. We might get a little more discussion or questions going that way too. Okay. All right, so I can talk to Todd and see if he can. I think it's you explaining the slides helps. Okay. And I and, and again, I, these are summary of this of this commentary. Right. So this, these are all taken out of, out of here. I got that other book. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's all right. I'll, I'll find it. Okay. She gets it. See, it's Jim. No, I have one at home, but this one's what? sitting in my car by itself. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> so but I've got five hours. Yeah. Let's pray and we'll let you go. <laughs> it's going to be very loud on the <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. Good and gracious God, we thank you that at the end of all things you will get the final word and it's always good to know that your word to us is life and joy and hope now that's three words but you'll get to say all those good words to us at the very end lord grant us the faith to endure each and every day no matter what tribulations or or joys you bring into our life we pray that we also might uh, be a good witness for you in all that we say and do that others who have questions or or just wonder or who are um drowning in doubts might be able to come to us and we might be able to give them encouragement and speak the good news to them lord help us to love even our enemies that they too might come to know you uh, we ask you to bless all the nations in the world and its leaders help them to make difficult decisions uh, watch over those who are being attacked unfairly by others uh, lord you know what's going on so please father just uh, bless our world for it is your world in all this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.